our speaker this afternoon attained his Master's of Divinity and Master's of Arts degree in Moral Theology from Mount St. Mary's Seminary in 1989. Ordained to the priesthood in that same year, Monsignor Pope has served at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington and was named a Monsignor in 2005 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has served as pastor at Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C. since 2007. He also blogs regularly for the Archdiocese of Washington. So please join me in welcoming back Monsignor Charles Pope. Monsignor Pope, it's such a joy to have you with us today, this first Sunday of Advent. Oh, good. Thank you very much. You know, um, the, the the overall theme, you know, of our, um, um, of our um, you know, Lenten observance here is, I mean, of our, our Advent observance here is, you know, keeping watch, keeping watch. And of course, that was very typified in the, um, in the, um, you know, the gospel for today in the Western Rite. And I say Western Rite because I realize that some of you go to Eastern Rites and some of you also go to the Extraordinary Form. But the Lord basically said, now look, you, you got, you've got to keep watch. It's like a man going on a journey. I'm just paraphrasing, of course. It's like a man going on a journey and he leaves his servants in charge, each with their own particular responsibilities. Um, but he may return at any hour. So you need, he needs to find you busy about what he gave, gave you to do. And what I say to you all, I say to everyone else, watch, watch, watch. So you'll notice that this idea of keeping watch is not some passive watching or passive waiting. Let me let me give you an example. Um, if I'm waiting for a bus, you know, I'm 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 looking. Is is it here yet? I'm just sitting there passively waiting for someone else to do something, namely pull a bus up, and I'm completely powerless in terms of what whether or not they come on time or don't, or whether the bus is full or empty, you know, so you see the idea. I'm completely passive. I'm utterly powerless. I'm just sitting there waiting and watching. That's a, that's a passive waiting and watching. Whereas uh, when the Lord says to us, that, by the way, the Greek word here that's translated watch is gregorite. Hmm? It means, again, literally to be watchful, to be ready, but in a very active sense. It's in the plural imperative, y'all, all y'all, keep watch. Now, this is not a passive form of the verb, it's active. So what's the difference between active and passive watching or waiting? Well, think about waiting, like um, you can wait for a bus, or but you can also wait on tables. And you see how different? We use the verb wait in very different senses. Obviously, someone who's waiting on tables is very active. They're alert. They see what the customer or the, the, of course, none of us can go to restaurants right now. I mean, practically not, but you get the idea. Um, you know, they're watching, they're waiting. Does the water need refilling? Is there a, a need? Are they waiting for the check? You know, there's a, it's a very active, vivid kind of watching. Um, whereas uh, very, very different from that passive waiting. We also see um, that, you know, when you, when you talk about watching. So for example, the idea is that um, I've always got my eye out for the fact that the master of the house, the Lord, as Jesus puts it, the Lord of the house might return. I've got my eye out for that. And so in the meantime, I'm staying busy and active about the things he wants so that when he comes, he will find the house in order. He will find it uh, well kept. He'll find things in supply, you know, whatever we're required to do to keep the house, all right? So you see the vision here. This is not some mere passive watching or waiting, okay? Now, with that in mind, though, I've kind of pulled in one direction. I almost want to pull in a different direction because part of what the Lord expects of us is to be still, to listen, to get quiet in front of him. So in other words, it's not like our duty is just to run around like Martha, but we also have to have Mary, see? In fact, by the way, just a, a quick take on the Martha and Mary thing. I'm a bit of a hawk on this. Some I, I hear too many sermons that go like this. Well, in the church, we need Marthas and we need Marys. No, we don't. We need Mary. 
um, who sat at the feet of the Lord and listened. You see, because then you just run off doing stuff and you don't even know if the Lord wants you to do it, you see? So it's not like, well, Martha is the active principle and Mary is the more uh, contemplative principle. No, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't buy it. Jesus is saying, Mary has chosen the better part and she will not be deprived of it. So Jesus warned, I'm not calling you to a mere activism or a mere busyness. I'm calling you to a careful, reflective life that is um, where you sit at my feet and you listen to me. Now, look, you know, Martha's running around trying to prepare, prepare this big you know, meal. There's no evidence that Jesus ever asked for that meal, right? He, what, what did Jesus most delight in? That he could feed others with his word. He, that's what he delighted in. It wasn't this, you know, serve me. So Jesus is a little more relaxed about all this. Martha's running around trying to prepare a meal. That she, There's no evidence in the text that she ever asked Jesus, do you want a meal? What can I prepare for you? So she kind of went off on her own agenda. Now, therefore, Mary is sitting at the feet of the Lord and listening to him. Now, at some point, Jesus might say to Mary, let's send out for pizza. You know, call the, call the Domino's pizza people or whoever. You know, I don't mean to give an advertisement, but, you know. But the point is that at some point, Mary might hear a call from Jesus say, well, let's get up and do something just now. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the watchfulness and the red and the waiting isn't just some activism. Do you follow me? Just I'm going to go off and run around and stay busy the way I think the Lord wants me to be busy. Question is, a lot of us, you know, run off and do stuff that we got no business doing because we never asked the Lord about it. And it might even be a good thing. Well, I'm going to go found a hospital or I'm going to engage in the great work of charity. But we never asked the Lord about it. We never said, you know, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Even with more serious things like getting married. It's surprising to me how many people just get engaged. Is it, have you asked the Lord about this? Well, we're in love, Father. We're in love. You know, what, what more is there needed? You know, well, you know, it might be good to ask the Lord about this, you know. But, or you take a new job in a different country, a different country or a different state. Your whole family gets uprooted and you move. Do you ask God about stuff like that? See, so what we want to be avoid, we want to be careful when we have this theme of watching and waiting is that uh, obviously it's not a passive watching and waiting, but neither is it an activist watching and waiting. We want that middle ground where we're able to still our soul and make room for God so that that still small voice of God that Elijah heard, not in the earthquake, uh, not in the uh, fire, not in the, the howling wind, but that still small voice where he said, Elijah, what's the deal, man? You're all worked up about stuff. What are you all worked up about? Well, Lord, it's just me. I'm the only one left. And the Lord finally said, Elijah, I got 7,000 people back there in Jerusalem that never bent the knee to Baal. And I got something for you to do. Now get up, eat, and let's get you moving. But you see, he had to get still to hear the voice of God. And this is what we mean in Advent. Um, it's not a passive waiting or watching. Neither is it an activist waiting or watching. It's that contemplative waiting and watching where we're looking for the Lord, listening for his voice. And we're, we're asking him to help us to understand and to, to recognize you know, his voice. And then we, we, do, we go about what he does. So with that in mind, I wanna read you a few scriptures that I have, okay? Um, that might kind of guide us um, in this prayerful watching and waiting, because I think in Advent, we want to make room in our heart for God. We want to, uh, and, and that means that we got to just push some things out of the way. You know, maybe there's something to give up for Advent or maybe something to take on. Now, we don't talk a lot about that in Advent, but Advent was originally a penitential season. It is not described that way by the, at least the Western rite of the church now. Anyone from the Eastern rites, is there, um, is there a penitential quality you expected to give up or is there some sense of that? Um, maybe you will talk about that more in the, con in the uh, question and answer period, but I'd be interested in knowing. But in the Western church, we've all but abandoned any penitential quality, any abstemious quality um, in Advent. It's more, we wear purple, that's about all that's left. 
Um, we omit the Gloria. That's about all that's left. For me, I'm, I'm giving up something for Advent, a minor thing. Um, and it's a shorter so-called abstinence or fast. But uh, I, I still try to do that. And I'd recommend that to a lot of you because I think that um, we, um, we almost never think about that in Advent, at least in the Western Roman rite. Um, and I'm not saying you're required to do it, you're not. In fact, you're not even required in Lent, except on those prescribed days of abstinence to give up something for the 40 days. It's a pious tradition that you're encouraged to do, but you're not required. So my only point to you in all that is you might think of penance, I mean, as Advent as, a, as more penitential than you do, because what we want to do is we want to make room in our hearts for God, um, to listen to him so that when the Savior comes, there's room in the inn because there was no room in the inn when he first came. And we want to make sure that in the inn of our heart, there's some room. And that means we sometimes have to make the room, okay? Now, let's give some scriptures here that talk a little bit about watching, waiting, okay? From Isaiah 30 and, the verse, and 15, Isaiah 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and in trust be your strength. He goes on to say, but you were unwilling. So you see, part of, I think, what we do to clear room in our hearts during Advent is to find a little extra time for prayer. You say, but Father, but Father, I'm more busy than ever. There's, well, th this year, maybe not so much, so much with, with COVID, right? Oh, gosh, COVID, the gift that keeps on taking. <laughs> but anyway, um, but, you know, maybe we're not doing quite as much shopping this year or Christmas parties and things. So maybe uh, there is a little extra time to spend that time and say, Lord, what you really want me to do in Advent is to just take some time and be quiet and be still with you. Like Martha, I'm sorry, like Mary at your feet, not the activist, but the, the contemplative listening to you. And eventually you'll have something for me to do. But for now, I want to not passively wait or involve myself in activism, but to be still, to sit at your feet, and to listen to you. Now, how do we listen? Well, sometimes you just sit there and listen. But sometimes we listen with our eyes. You can take up some of the scriptures for the day and read them. But I mean, read them devotionally uh, in a way that is not just, oh, yeah, 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 this passage. Yeah, yeah, I know this one. And you just quickly read it, and you're done. But rather, you, you read a few lines, and you stop. What's the Lord saying to me? What does this mean for me? It's kind of a Lexio Divina. Hmm? And we've talked about that here at the ICC on many occasions. Any of you who've been regulars here know that you've got lots of places to go if you want to learn the full Lexio Divina method. But basically, it means to slowly, carefully, devotedly read the Word of God, to then meditate and pray over it, and, um, and make some sort of resolution um, as you finish. So again, this would be again, uh, in returning and in rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust, your strength lies. Okay, so this is an, an image for prayer. Hmm? Another, another passage from Habakkuk says this, uh, Habakkuk 2 and verse 20. <clears throat> but the Lord is in his holy temple, so that all the earth be silent before him. Now, as Catholics, this is a beautiful thing for us because the Lord's in his tabernacle. And even if you don't have regular Eucharistic adoration going on 24 hours a day, most of you hopefully can still have access to your churches. They're not locked. But you can come to the temple of the Lord and pray. He's there. He's waiting. And you go before him and just keep silence for a little while and prepare your souls because the Savior's coming and you want there to be a room at the inn when he comes. Another one, Psalm 46 and verse 10 simply says this, be still and know that I am God. Shh, be still. Stop all this running around. Stop for a minute. Just understand, I am God. I'm your Lord. I'm your Father. I love you. You can, you know, I, I, I have only the best things in mind for you. And even sometimes when you don't think the blessings all come in packages, you understand, I want you to know I'm in the blessing business. If you will just be still. There's an old gospel song we sing sometimes here at the parish. Be still, 
be still. You know, the God will fight your battles if you just be still. You know, just it's a kind of an old, an old spiritual. Be still. God will fight your battles if you just be still. Uh, so we have these these images, um, you know, of uh, being still, watching, waiting, being more contemplative, listening, making room in our heart uh, for God. Okay. There is uh, so some other ones here. Uh, for example, Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 13. Be silent before the Lord, all people. For the Lord has roused himself from his holy dwelling. So now notice this. This is kind of a Christmas theme. God has roused himself from his holy dwelling. He's coming down from heaven um, to us. So therefore, what, what should we do? Be silent. Be silent before the Lord. All the people, all you people. For the Lord has roused himself from his holy dwelling. He's pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And what's our goal? Get all excited? Run around? Decorate trees? No. Be still. Be still. There's a time to decorate trees. But there's also a time to be still. Be still. So we're watching. We're waiting. Not passively and not with activism, but a, 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 an active listening to God in a very contemplative kind of a way. Another one, Zephaniah, um, chapter one and verse seven, be silent or be silent in the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord is near. So again, stop all the acting, running around, shopping till you shop till you drop kind of stuff. Find time. If you got to do some of that stuff, get it done late, but find time to be silent, and quiet and still before the Lord. Shh, stop, stop. Wait, 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 wait. Shh, stop. Stop. Cut it out. Shh, shh. But, but I have um, Be quiet. So this is the, um, we want to, uh, you know, emphasize this. There's a beautiful thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 8. And they're blowing the trumpets and all these terrible things are happening. But finally it says, when the Lamb, namely Jesus, opened up the seventh seal of the scroll... Seven being a sign of perfection, right? When the word, if you will, is now perfected, if you will, the word made flesh, you know, this moment where the word comes forth from the womb of the Blessed Mother, if you want to just kind of put it in the Christmas cycle. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven uh, for about a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> a half an hour, you know, but you see the idea. Take some time every day, maybe a half hour, maybe an hour, but take some time to grow silent. Open up that scroll. Now, you and I, you remember in the book, I'm going to grab my Bible here. In the Bible, it talks about a, a scroll with seven seals. Now, books were less known in those days. They call these codexes. This idea of a book that's bound here and you can, you know, open up anywhere into it was fairly unknown at the time of the Bible. They had scrolls. And it's kind of like the old cassette tapes that some of us remember. You got to be a little older to remember that. I'm sorry. If you remember cassette tapes and you actually use them, you're old. You're old. Okay. Um, but um, that's you, you, it's sequential. But, and so that's like those scrolls were like. So a scroll or a book, right? But look, brothers and sisters, because of Jesus Christ, we have a perfect right to open the scroll now, not by our own, but not by our own dignity, but by the glory of God to open up the scroll and understand the true meaning of life. You see, in that scroll in the book of Revelation was contained every answer and the whole meaning of life. And um, here it is. And no one was found worthy in heaven or earth to open up that scroll, break open the so seals and open up that scroll. But then suddenly, do not be despairing for the line of the tribe of Judah has conquered and he is worthy to receive the scroll and break open its seals. And he breaks it open. And this is for us, what he's done for us. And so you and I, because of him and him alone have the perfect right to break open this scroll. And break open, you know, those seals. Only the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, could do that for us. Now, what is Scripture? I don't want to give you a long discourse on Scripture. I want to just say this. Scripture is a prophetic declaration 
of reality. Whatever you think is going on, this is what's really going on. See, this is, tells us the meaning of our life, the goal of our life, the destiny of all creation, where things are headed. And by the way, I cheated and I looked at the back of the book. It's still there. Thank God it wasn't blotted out. Jesus wins. Are you praying with me? I mean, you, you, you understand this is a prophetic declaration of reality. It's not just an opinion. It's not just a lovely collection of stories, you know, or whatever people want. Or, you know, Thomas Jefferson liked the ethical teachings of Jesus, but not the miracles. It, this is bigger than any of that. This is a prophetic declaration of reality. This is, tells you what's really going on. This tells you what your life's really about, see? And so, uh, as Jesus takes this scroll and breaks open that seventh seal and opens it, a whole meaning of everything is contained in it. You know what? There was silence in heaven for a half hour. Be still. Put every thought out of your mind. God is about to speak. So when you take the scriptures and read it devoutly, maybe it's again like Alexio Divina. Don't just pull it over and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've read this before. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember what Father so-and-so said about that. Uh-huh. Good. Okay, we're done here. No, no, no. Here's how you take it. Be still, my soul. Maybe for a half hour or whatever that, that is for you. Be still. God is about to speak to me. And every word is written in love. Verbum dei non est quali cumque verbum, said verbum spirens amorem, says St. Augustine. The word of God is not any old word. It is the word breathing forth love. This is a love letter from God. This is a letter of admonition, but it's also of love. And he says to us, I want you to understand the true meaning of your life, of the world, of what's going on all around you. And I want you to remember that you have the victory. If you will stay with me, even if they kill you, the worst thing they can do to you is kill you. Maximum promotion. You'll be among my martyrs in heaven. Okay. So I, I could go on and on, but I want you to see that there's this magnificent moment where the word, again, remember Jesus is the word made flesh and we're getting to ready to welcome him again at Christmas. But the word made flesh breaks open this scroll and the whole meaning of everything is set forth. And the prelude to that should be reverent silence. So it says, there was silence. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, as if to say, be still, my soul. God is about to speak. And what he's going to say is more important than anything I'll ever hear. I've got to still my soul and make room for this word. Okay. So this is an Advent theme of watching and waiting. Okay. Now, a, a couple of other things, uh, maybe a couple of other quotes and a um, few more remarks and maybe get some comments from you. Um, there is a, um, there's a very interesting text from Wisdom in the 18th chapter. And it's actually talking about a very dreadful night when the angel of death went over and, um, and, and killed every firstborn in Egypt, but passed over the house of the, uh, the houses of the Jewish people who had the blood of the lamb on their door. But it says this, we can interpret this also though in more of a Christmas way. It says this from Wisdom 18 and verse 14. For when peaceful stillness encompassed everything and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all powerful word from heaven's royal throne leapt into the, do into the doomed land. So as dreadful as that original meaning is, isn't this also a beautiful meaning for Christmas? That again, when peaceful stillness encompassed everything and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all powerful word, the Lord Jesus Christ, leapt from heaven's royal throne into a doomed land. Our land was doomed, but Jesus leapt into it to save us. And he didn't just so much come out to get us out of trouble as to get into trouble with us. And um, he comes to save and to set us free. 
And this, this all-powerful word leapt forth from heaven um, to, to be with us. Now, notice again, it's a doomed land. Um, remember, the original context of this is the angel of death coming and taking the first lies of all the Egyptians. But I want to say to you that what Jesus does on Christmas night is that he makes a daring raid behind enemy lines into Satan's lair. And he does it with silence, stealthily. We sing silent night, holy night, but it's really D-Day <laughs> in the sense that stealthily, quietly, Jesus comes in behind enemy lines and takes up his place. And Satan seems to be aware of something, but he doesn't quite understand. And you remember that he's aware that something's going on in his, his lair. And you remember how he wildly stabbed at, at all the two-year-old children, two years old, older and younger, uh, trying to find this Christ child. We think Satan is omniscient that he knows everything. He doesn't. He seems to be aware of a presence in, in his kingdom of some light, and he doesn't understand it. And through his agent, Herod, he's, he tries to find out who is this child. And he can't find him. And he wildly stabs, sadly killing all the holy innocents. But this image of Jesus quietly, silently, leaping down from heaven, to a um, into our doomed world, or it says here, a doomed land to rescue us. You see the vision? And of course, all those Jewish people were re rescued in the, in the great Passover, and we too are taken out in this great Passover of the Lamb. So we see um, some, some very powerful images, but notice how silence is a key element to all of them, right? Silence, waiting, watching, not passive, but not activistic, but that middle ground we would call kind of a holy, watchful listening to God, uh, like Mary at the feet of Jesus, as opposed to Martha, the activist, Mary sitting at his feet and listening to him, okay? Now, with that in mind, that's a, that beautiful um, picture of, um, um, let's see if I got my, I got to get my notes here. You know, that, that image of your, your eternal word leapt down from heaven into a doomed land, um, leaving his royal throne. I want to read you uh, an Advent hymn. For me, the, for my money, it's the best Advent hymn ever written. It was written by St. Ambrose. And it's not just a good Advent hymn. It's a kind of a summary of all, of all salvation history in about five verses. <laughs> it's amazing. But it picks up on that theme. Again, let me read it one more time from Wisdom. When peaceful stillness encompassed everything, and when the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's throne leapt down into a doomed land. Now, here's what St. Ambrose writes. I'm reading not the Latin. He wrote it in Latin, but this is a good English translation that's also beautifully poetic. But listen to the majesty of this hymn and meditate on its magnificence. Come thou, redeemer of the earth, come manifest your virgin birth. All lands admire, all times applaud, such is the birth that fits our God. And here comes the second verse. From forth from his chamber goeth he, that royal home of purity, a giant in twofold substance one, rejoicing now his course to run. From God the Father he proceeds, to God the Father back he speeds, runs out his door, runs out his course to death and hell, and returns on God's high throne to dwell. O oh, equal to thy father, thou gird on thy fleshly mantle now. The weakness of our mortal state with deathless might invigorate. For your cradle here shall glitter bright, and darkness breathe a newer light, where endless faith shall shine serene, and twilight never intervene. A magnificent, just, just magnificent, quick summary. That, that, that one verse, all of salvation history. Forth from his father goeth he, that royal home of, of, of purity, runs out his course to death and hell, returns on God's high throne to dwell. Just like that. Four verses, all of salvation history, right? Still yourself. And um, I'll publish, you know, I have this on my blog, but I'll publish it this week about the best Advent hymn. But this is the kind of stuff, get still, Get quiet and meditate on the glory 
of what took place at Christmas. Make room in your hearts for God. Make room. Quiet. Be still. Actively listen for God like Mary at his feet. A final thought, and then I'll get your reactions. Um, a lot of us are anxious today. I'm, a, I'm anxious. We're all anxious. We got this COVID thing that just doesn't seem to want to go away. A lot of us are suspicious that we're either being lied to or that this thing is either more serious or less serious, where people are both a combination of anxious and cynical. You've got the election results. People are anxious and cynical on both sides of this. You've got, of course, just uh, the general, all the thing we went through with, uh, you know, the struggles with you know, racial injustice and that conversation on race we've been through in our country. All these things are going on and we're stirred up, we're anxious. And I get so many people who come to me all like, ah, like this. And I say, you know what I say to them? You've been watching too much cable news. Don't watch so much of that stuff. You know, they are literally, you know, I would call it panic porn. Pardon the expression. It's, it's very ugly what they're doing to us. And I, I can, I, the highest recommendation I can make to, to somebody in Advent is consider giving up a lot of that. You may need to keep some headlines. You may have a job that requires you to be on top of the, but at the end of the day, most of us don't need to be listening to half of that stuff or even 90% of that stuff. It's meant to get us angry. It's meant to get us fearful. You know, if you, if you find out what a person can fear, you can control them. And I have never seen this country so under control as I have now. We are um, not to be afraid. Jesus, how many times did Jesus say, do not be afraid? Even of the worst thing, death or suffering, there is more to life than not getting sick or not dying. Most of you know I had COVID and I had it bad. I was 11 days in the ICU in, in respiratory failure. That's because I have pulmonary issues that one day, one day it'll kill me. We're all going to die of something. I might also get shot. <laughs> you know, I hope not, but I mean, you know, but the point is that um, I, I, I was uh, in the high risk category, but you know, I got it. And sure enough, it went right for the lungs, but I, I'm, a, I'm a survivor. I was, I was treated and I'm well now. 99% um, of people who get it survive, you see. And yet we're all running around in a panic. Part of that, I'm not saying there's nothing to be concerned with here. I'm not saying 250,000 deaths are nothing. But I'm simply saying that somewhere we've gone over the top with fear, with anxiety, and not just about that, but also about elections or about uh, other aspects of uh, the race and all the things that are going on in our country. And I would say that you would do well in Advent to consider for your own peace of mind to watch a lot less news because they buy and sell on this stuff, all right? Uh, if that's too harsh, I'm sorry, but ju I just wanted to leave you with a practical suggestion. We all need to find more time to be quiet, to listen to the Lord, to prepare our hearts and make room in our hearts. And if they're all stirred up with anxiety and anger and frustration about everything that's going on in the world, which by the way, much of it is very real, and I'm not saying we can completely ignore it, there were big stakes in this election, big stakes. But at the end of the day, there's not much we can do about it. You know, we had to go before God and say, I'm, I come before you like a blind beggar. I don't understand why the world's going in directions it's going in, but Lord, you do. Just show me what I should do and help me to stay in my lane and not get off into other people's jobs. So at the end of the day, I, I just offer that to you as a final suggestion. That said, again, back to my original theme. Let's get some then reactions from you. Uh, I was told to talk maybe about 40 minutes. So we're, we're just over that. So we have this idea of a waiting and a watching. But again, that middle ground between pure passive waiting. Is the boss here yet? No. Okay. That's passive. But also to avoid the activism that I gave you the example of Martha. But to find that active, that, 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 that alive, alert, watching and waiting that we see in Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, Mary of Bethany, um, this is our Advent call, right? I, I think that one way to do that is, again, to get rid of some of this TV stuff I said. 
Uh, or another way, of course, would be to give up a little something else. But find that time to just be quiet with the Lord and carefully, quietly read his word, listen to him, and um, be ready when he comes. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Um, ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hands, Christ our God to earth descends, our full homage to demand. And at his feet, the six-winged seraph, cherubim with ceaseless eye, veil their faces to the presence as with ceaseless voice they cry, Alleluia, Lord most high. Silence. With that in mind, any questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Well, I'd love to get started with some questions um, or if anyone has any kind of thoughts to share with Monsignor Pope. Um, Monsignor, maybe if I could just start with one of my own, actually, one of the things I was thinking of as you were speaking was, um, you know, my family had a much quieter Thanksgiving this year, just some of my immediate family, as opposed to typically we have a gathering of 40 or 50 extended relatives. So a lot of that time was spent quiet, like we were reading or each doing our own kind of uh, time together, but, um, and I kind of was reflecting on how, how to make time of silence. I feel like I am always wanting something to be purposeful and like driven or leading to something. And is it, is it having a set intention when you have time of silence to make sure that it's not feeling wasteful or is it okay if you sometimes just feel like it's wasteful, not wasteful, but yeah. I don't know if I can quite put into words. I, I know your point exactly. I, first of all, there are, you know, maybe very worldly people consider our time spent in worship as frivolous and wasteful. We burn things up, just give them to God, you know, incense and candles and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, um, we're supposed to, um, you know, kind of, if you will, pardon the expression, waste time with God. Uh, in, in a certain sense, from the world's point of view, not, not, not from truth, our time spent in worship is, well, we could be out earning money. What do you mean take Sunday off? What are you talking about? I mean, we could be out earning money, um, but there, there, no, no, actually, um, we're, God expects us to just take some time and waste it. Now, that's in the quotes, of course, from a worldly point of view. Um, but I would also say, getting back to your other question about silence, you know, silence isn't the absence of sound, it's the absence of self. Does that make sense? So in other words, you, you, you might, in your quote, silence, you might be listening to a very edifying song that helps you to focus on God. But something that gets you outside of yourself, we get so, if we're, you know, St. Augustine speaks of the, the human person is so easily in curvatus and say, he's just turned in on himself. And God wants to turn us out to love one another, to love him and to love others. And in this, we really find ultimately our goal. Um, so the idea of silence, again, isn't just the absence of sound, it's the absence of self, all focus, oh, this is going wrong, what am I going to do about this, what am I going to do about that, and just, have you ever been to a movie, only once or twice in my life can I say this, that I was so brought into a movie that I watched that I lost any sense of myself, and all of a sudden when I came back to myself, I was like, oh my gosh, um, but that's the goal. I think with the, this idea of silence, is absence not so much of sound, but of self, all the fretting and worrying that we so easily do. And, and look, I'm, I struggle with, we all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, this question is coming from Joel from Missouri. Joel writes that he is new to Catholicism and wondering if you would have any suggestions on a text on penance from a respected source for helping to, him to understand penance better understand penance or like going to confession what is that i'm not quite sure oh that's a good question joel just wrote in so um joel if you want to yeah yeah but probably um mm -hmm. preparing for confession maybe yeah <laughs> can, I, can, I, can i be really uh nasty and pr promote my own book Oh, go for it, Monsignor Pope. I'm sure it's wonderful. <laughs> I wrote a book. It's just a little paperback. I mean, for, you know, I'm not known for brevity, but this thing is less than 100 pages. A little paperback you can even keep in your coat pocket. It's called The Ten Commandments. I stole the title, by the way. <clears throat> and it's a meditation on the Ten Commandments rooted in the teachings of the Catechism. And in the back, there are several 
Very, I, I think I got them from many sources, but several very good examinations of conscience. Um, but the idea is to sort of enter into the Ten Commandments in a kind of a richer way than just, well, I didn't murder anybody today. So Fifth Commandment, check a rony, you know, but to go, go a little deeper. Um, and it's a very brief book. It's meant to prepare people for confession. So called the Ten Commandments by Monsignor Charles Pope. And please, there are some ICC talks and things that you can recommend, though. Those would be good, too. Yes, certainly. Um, thank you, Monsignor Pope. I know that we have used um, that book and sent it to a few people when they've asked similar things. So I know that is a good one. Um, Ahmed, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, um, I get the reason like why we have Advent, uh, you know, waiting for the second coming. But I don't, like, why is that important when like, Jesus comes to us every day uh, in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Eucharist. Another question uh, that kind of related to it, um, why is, you know, like keep visual or advent of seasons or it's only, well, mainly emphasized uh, like during this season rather than, you know, year long, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the church um, has seasons and um, it, 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 it doesn't really pertain to us to keep 25 balls in the air juggling, you know, we're not very good at that. So sometimes the church says, let's focus on this part of the Paschal mystery right now. Let's focus over here on this. So well, in, in, at, in Lent, we focus on getting ready for the great Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection. In Advent, we focus on the um, getting ready for the incarnation. Um, other times in seasons, you know, we focus on discipleship, like, you know, ordinary time. Ordinary doesn't mean ordinary, it means ordinal, like numbered Sundays. Um, and so I think like any good mother, the church knows that it's helpful for us to have a focus. Uh, even though, yes, everything's always true. It's never like, well, Jesus didn't really get born and, you know, we have to redo this. Uh, but rather, it's, it's an idea for us to, to spend some particular time and focus on getting ready for this or that aspect of, of our redemption history. Now, finally, this. Um, we speak of our, our remembering in the liturgical year as anamnesis. Anamnesis is not just we're recalling distant events from the past, but rather, no, that those events are made present to us. So Christ is born. Today is born our Savior, we say at Christmas time, Christ the Lord. Today. Well, wait a minute. That was 2,000 some years ago. No, no, no. It's made that event is made present to us. Likewise, every mass, as you said, I mean, he, Jesus always comes. He's present in the Eucharist. He's in the mass in every mass. But notice again, in every mass, the sacrifice of Calvary and his resurrection and ascension are all made present to us in that mass. It's not a distant event. Oh, look what he did 2000 years ago. But rather, we get in our time machine and we're brought to that event or that event is brought to us. And this is, by the way, from the Jewish people who had the same concept that Passover wasn't just some distant event. You were, you're, 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 you're in the Passover. You're in the Exodus. How was this night different from other nights? The, the question goes, and the answer is, well, my father was a wandering Aramean and God, you know, and, and the thing goes on, but basically we, we are in these events and they're made present to us, but because of our humanity, where it's not possible to focus on 25 or 30 things, the church as a good mother bids us to kind of take certain times of the year and focus on these things. Great, thank you. Um, we are getting a lot of questions um, that I'll kind of synthesize into one, but most of them are really asking how. So how, how can we listen with faith and not with doubt? How can we allow ourselves to mm -hmm. kind of be selfless and focused on reflecting on God and not letting our thoughts wander back to ourselves. Could you give some maybe practical steps into how to be still and how to pray in this way? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's easy to get discouraged when we just think about our own situation or if not our own situation, our own country at this time, or, you know, some of us who are pro-life think, well, God, you kind of let us down here. We're gonna, we never, it seems like anytime we get, you know, a little bit of progress, boom, uh, you know, you know, I could, we could, I could give you other examples, but I'm just trying to illustrate. I understand the discouragement. 
that can come if we focus primarily on our own personal lives or on our own country or our situation. So the question is, well, how, how to overcome some of this? I would argue that um, we need to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is really amazing when you think about it. Um, a lot of times people think, well, the church is down and out, our numbers are dropping. And in the West they are, although in other parts of the world they're growing, but you get the idea. But you know, I got news for you. The church is 2000 years old. And I got even more news for you. If you take our Jewish, uh, in our Jewish years, we're 5000 years old. And you know what? Heresies have come and gone, nations have risen and fallen, empires have risen and fallen, enemies of the church have said, we'll destroy you. Where's Napoleon now? Where's Caesar? You know, where's the USSR? They're gone. And here we are still preaching the same gospel. You know, I got, I just think that sometimes you got to see the broad sweep of history and see that the, that the church is indefectible, not by our, I mean, we're the mess, but the, but Jesus had said somehow in all of this, you might not always feel like you're winning, but there's more to winning than getting every battle. But to perdure and to continue to preach this same gospel. And you know, when all this current foolishness has come and gone, we'll still be here preaching. You know, the church is going to be here. People always promise, oh, you're about to be destroyed. You're nothing now. Nah. You know, so stay with Jesus, stay with the winning team. We're, we are Noah's Ark. And guess what? The Ark is smelly. It's got a lot of crazy stuff going on. And even the eight people on the Ark don't get along very well. And they haven't bathed for like 35 or 40 days. But it's the Ark. And God is there. And we're going to get through this because we always do. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen to that. Sharon, do you still have something to share? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, um, Monsignor, for your comment on opening the scroll. It touched my heart. I could, you know, I will approach opening the scripture in a different way because of how that touched me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, had, I had separated the scroll in, in other words, I didn't think of uh, scripture as a scroll, but it was beautiful. But I also wanted to comment a um, in going through the scripture, um, the Isaiah scripture, behold, you are angry. We are all sinful, unclean people. Even our good deeds are like polluted rags. We are beggars. You know, um, it, that I think that I had in, in my preparation um, coming to the need I need a savior. Mm -hmm. And it's like somewhere along the line, it, you know, um, I, I mean, I go to mass daily. I, you know, do Lexio, you know, uh, and I can sort of check that box and, you know, maybe separate my uh, prayer life from my daily life. It's all of the same cloth, but that. I need to be saved. And in the end, it is not I who saved myself. I, I mean, I can know that in an intellectual way, but to really touch my heart to know that Jesus Christ is the savior and I need saving. This world needs saving. We are not able to save ourselves, And if we are not yet convinced of that, we should look about us. <laughs> and uh, instead of being discouraged to recognize that Jesus Christ has the victory and we are living into it in our fidelity to one another. It, it's, it's not just my salvation. It is all of us in the ark, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it touched me greatly. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, you get the point of the reading today. I actually made that the main point of my homily this weekend in the parish, which is that we need a savior. We're, 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 we're in pretty bad shape without him. But with him, you know, so here's the basic kerygma. You want to, I'll give you a, a, a quick thumbnail of the kerygma that all the apostles taught in the, in, you know, there's about eight different sermons in the Acts of the Apostles. They call that the kerygma, the early preaching. Here's the basic model. You got it bad and that ain't good. But there's a doctor in the house and his name is Jesus. And if you will give your life to him, he will go to work in your life. And he will begin to help you from the mess you are and the mess you've made. 
that's that's my sort of urban dictionary version of the uh, of the the basic charisma that all the apostles say. They're very in, politically incorrect. You know, we're always oh don't don't be negative. We are we are a welcoming community. And and Peter says, you all kill God. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, and they're struck to the heart and they repent. But you see the idea. I mean, it's a it's a powerful image today in Isaiah from the Roman right. Uh, their first reading. Uh, by gosh, um, we need a savior badly. Mm -hmm. Yes, Monsignor Pope. Um, we had Craig right, and you asked during your reflection about the um, practices in the Eastern church and he is greek malkite and says that during advent they start their fast on november 15th so they mm. do fast yeah and, and father hezekiah has also talked about that too yeah. just the period of fasting mm -hmm. well, these guys are heroes compared to us in the western roman right we're a bunch of ninnies <laughs> <laughs> i say that with love i'm one of them but i tried to add i try to do something during advent too yeah so monsignor pope if you could um lead us in prayer here at the conclusion of today's event yes we thank you lord and in the first re uh the first prayer for mass in the roman rite today you ask us to uh we ask that by your grace that we can run toward you who are coming toward us and um it's a beautiful image of um you coming to us and we running toward you so keep us faithful in that and um keep us also faithful though to that that careful uh, watchful silence that is necessary for us where we don't just run off in our own direction, but we run with you. So Lord, please now bless everyone and may the peace and the blessing of almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon all of you and remain with you forever, amen.